Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the August 24th, 2020 Town of Danvers School Committee meeting. This is David Thompson, chair of the Danvers School Committee. And before we begin tonight's meeting, I'd like to address how and why it's been structured the way it is. You'll see that my colleagues and I, along with the administrative team for the Danvers Public Schools, are attending this meeting in the multi-purpose room at the Holton Richmond Middle School. We're doing so keeping social distancing in mind in order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus. Mary Beth Berry is not able to join us tonight and Keith Taverna is not here either because he is spending time with his family as they celebrate the birth of their second daughter, Maggie Clover Taverna, who was born on Saturday and we wish them all the best and most importantly, a little bit of sleep. Uh, we did have some requests to have this meeting open to the public, and we tried to think of ways in which we could do so safely, as we believe that um, public input for public schools is very important. Because there was no fair way to determine who would be allowed to attend and who would not, due to space limitations resulting from COVID-19, we were advised by legal counsel not to invite the public to attend in person. This does not mean that your voices have not and will not continue to be heard. The administration has worked hard to provide as much information regarding the reopening of schools this September as possible, and will provide more detailed information tonight and in the weeks to come. We have publicized the email address info at danvers.org many times prior to our school committee meetings. Getting questions in advance allows each email to be reviewed and answered by the appropriate administrator or town department, such as the DPW in the case of HVAC systems. These questions will be read at tonight's meeting and will be answered to the best of the administration's ability. Duplicate questions or those very similar in nature have been grouped together and will be responded to accordingly. Like in the past several weeks, the FAQ document regarding reopening schools next month is up on the district website and has been updated to, has been updated as answers are known. The FAQ document will be updated again after tonight's meeting and posted to the district website tomorrow. I will now call the meeting to order with the Pledge of Allegiance. Next is our mission statement. The Danvers Public Schools is, is a dynamic community of independent learners dedicated to respect, responsibility, creativity, and the pursuit of academic and personal excellence. And now we'll move on to information from the superintendent. Thank you. We have three major items for this evening's meeting. First, to introduce our new Highlands Elementary School principal and our Holton Richmond Middle School assistant principal. So first, I would like to introduce um, our elementary principal, and then I'll ask Adam Federico, our principal at the middle school, to introduce our new assistant principal. We welcome John Ombrowski to the Danvers Public Schools for the Highlands principalship. He has been a principal um, for 15 years in the Everett Public Schools with a total of 25 years of experience in education. Um, he has um, worked through the, the school departments at the administrative level as a director, school leader, worked with grants, building after school learning programs, focusing on social emotional learning, and developing art integration programs along with supporting healthy activities in schools through federal funding. This was a unique opportunity this year with COVID, so all of our hiring has been done remotely. Um, so we got to meet John through the screening committee, um, a group of parents and teachers at this school working with Violetta Powers and Mary Wormer. And then also he had the opportunity to meet with PAC and has been working with our administrative team. So at this point in time, I'd like to ask John to step to the podium to share a few words about coming to Danvers. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you all for having me here this evening. I'm very excited to be part of the Danvers, Danvers community, Danvers Public Schools and Highlands. I'd especially like to thank the superintendent and the search committee for this opportunity. I'm very excited to start the school year. I'd like to mention uh, the secretary of the Highland School, Denise Halloran, as well as the custodian, Steve Chiasen, who have been working with me and working tirelessly to prepare the school for the fall. And we are very excited for the opening of the Highland School come the fall. And uh, we are prepared and ready to go. Thank you. Thanks, John. Welcome to Danvers. Thank Let's you. see if 
any of my colleagues have any comments? Welcome. Eric? Glad to have you here. Thank you. Right. Welcome. Jeff? And Arthur. Nope. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Right. Excellent. Thank you so much for, for joining us and for being here tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. So next I ask Anna Federico to introduce Julie. Thank you, pleasure to be here tonight. I'm very excited to introduce Ms. Julie Sproy, our new assistant principal at Holton Richard Middle School. She brings close to 20 years experience as a world language teacher and department head at Linfield High School. And we had a, a very um, thorough search process involving teachers, parents, um, students helped develop our interview questions. And Ms. Sproy came out um, as the top choice unanimously of our committee. So we're very excited to welcome her to Holton Richmond and Danvers. Hi, good evening. I am very excited to be here to start this unique year, I guess is one word to, to use to describe it. Um, I wanna thank the superintendent, the search committee for, the, for giving me this opportunity, the transition this summer from High school to the middle school has been really smooth. The administrative assistants here, the custodial staff, Adam, Patrick, the other assistant principal, everyone has been so welcoming and we are working really hard to get the building ready to go for the fall and I'm really excited to welcome the students. Thanks Julie, thank you for being here tonight as well. Uh, Arthur? Same thing, thanks for coming, welcome <laughs> to Danvers. Welcome. Thank Glad you. to have you. Best of luck. Oh, thank you. And that will close tonight's school committee meeting. No. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dana. Thank you. Thank you to Adam and welcome to John and Julie. Thank you. Um, as part of that transition, the administrative team has been meeting um, here in our schools and is working um, through the process of reopening. So our next item for this evening's meeting is a reopening of schools update. We have members of our administrative team that will join us in this presentation, and Mary and I will begin the presentation. So a lot has happened in the last two weeks since we have been together. I see Mary has the presentation up there. Um, we will also post the presentation on the school website for tomorrow, so that way it will be available for the community to take a look at also. Dr. Dana, we also want to let our new administrators leave if they would like. Thank you. Um, we have decided that they will stay just a little bit longer. So okay, that great. Way if you um, do have questions, also. Okay, um, perfect. In the I just remote, didn't. Um, reopening, and then we also have um, handbooks. Oh, um, perfect. So Thank you. So they'll be able to support us with that. I did hear that too. Thank you. That yep. we we have this revolving door piece of it as administrators are able to come and, and share their pieces and then um, go to the next one. Okay, so we do have the presentation up there. We are in a different spot, so it's just gonna take me a moment. I'm gonna pull it up on my computer also, so that way. Um, I can just see it as Mary goes through. Okay, so again, as we have been working with our strategic plan, this is working together for all of our students, and we have had our reopening. We continue to keep this slide on every meeting. There have been a number of members of our community, the school community, the town of Danvers, that have been working together week after week, um, coming together on a Tuesday morning, a Wednesday morning, to meet as a group, ask questions of each other, share ideas, and then go back and do the work between um, each week. So uh, we, again, appreciate so much the commitment of everyone here and um, everyone who has been sending us information through the um, information at danvers.org. The last two meetings, which those minutes will be part, of the public comment will be part of the minutes that will also be posted on the website tomorrow. We've had practically 100 emails each time. So, and again, once we did the survey, asking parents to fill out hybrid or full remote, we had another about 100 emails that came in and be able to answer those um, specific questions or put them into the FAQ um, as we were able to move forward. Next, we have a graphic um, that really talks about the work again, that all of this work centers around the work for our students, for their education, and it takes all of us, administration, families, and our faculty and staff working together um, for our students. 
Okay. As we continue to move for this, through this, you'll see different times tonight we're going to continue to go back to the word safety. And safety is the piece that we are all looking at. That's what we have as an agreement. We want to come back to school with safety measures in place that will continue to lower the risk. So it, it always will be a combination of strategies, not one strategy, but a combination of these mitigation strategies. Hand washing, the mask face covering, physical distancing, and staying home when sick. So those are the things, and again, I see us practicing that here this evening for this meeting. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it back to Mary to take us through the learning models and the actual schedules that have been put together over the last two weeks. So in my part of the presentation tonight, I'm gonna to talk to you about what we've been doing since our last meeting on October, on October, on <laughs> August 6th. Um, so we left off October 6th with the vote for uh, the hybrid learning. And we also, also told you about a state-sponsored remote learning alternative, which was our thinking at the time that we were going to explore that model. But as we uh, left the meeting and spent our Friday uh, researching uh, the state-sponsored uh, alternative, it just did not make sense for our students and for our teachers in Danvers to uh, opt to do a fully a different curriculum. Um, and what the state uh, kind of talked about they were gonna deliver, they did not deliver and was not gonna be feasible. So our charge then was to, to decide if it was we were able to put together a hybrid model to, uh, and a remote alternative running simultaneously together in Danvers. So as we spent the, the next two weeks, we've, we've you know, answered two questions. One was, can those models work together? And the second one is, can we staff that, that the two models? So we've worked on that, and I think over, you know, as we ran up to Friday, we really kind of were getting the understanding, you know, the survey data from the families, seeing how, what percent of, students were gonna be in the hybrid model and what percent were gonna be in the remote model and then kind of our staffing situation that we have, we found that we are able to, at this time, run both models simultaneously. And at this time, we have 84.3% uh, of our students will be in the hybrid model and we have 15.7 in our remote model. So this uh, Danvers rem uh, remote learning alternative model Again, it runs simultaneously with the hybrid model. The students will receive some synchronous um, instruction from Danvers teachers for part of the day. Elementary students will have synchronous instruction in reading, phonics, word study, and math for a portion of the day. And the secondary students will have synchronous instruction in each class for a portion of their 90 minute blocks. And we'll get more into that in a few minutes with the details. So um, there's also a component of asynchronous work that they will be doing when they are not with their teacher during the synchronous time. So what does this look like together? So looking like together is we have the hybrid model and the fully remote. Uh, the hybrid, there's two days at school, they have full synchronous learning with their classroom teacher and specialist. Uh, the two days at home, we're approximately about a quarter of the day is synchronous uh, learning for the core curriculum with a fully remote teacher. And the remainder of the school day will be uh, working on asynchronous work. And then for the fully remote class, they'll be working approximately a half of the day with their fully remote teacher. Um, and they will be working the remainder of the day on the asynchronous learning. Wednesdays is a similar look for all teachers because uh, the morning is gonna have shortened periods of time where students receive instruction. And then around lunchtime, students will have asynchronous work to complete in the afternoon because very important to our model is teacher planning time. So the afternoon will be uh, it, uh, given t to the teachers to work and plan because these models cannot work together without teachers communicating and planning and delivering lessons uh, very consistently. So that is gonna be a charge that we have and uh, the work that we're gonna be doing with teachers, uh, ten, the 10 days that we're beginning the school year, uh, we'll be doing a lot of work to jumpstart and get, um, get on the same page. Uh, so let's get into a little bit of specifics. This is a similar uh, graphic at the elementary level. Um, but the keys here are that the classroom teacher is assigned to either, is either a hybrid teacher or a fully remote teacher. The proportion of hybrid to the fully remote teachers is dependent on the, the ratios that are coming out in the family surveys, which we, have a much, we had a much clearer picture on Friday and then even through the weekend we still got a few more responses, so we're able to round that work out. 
And then, so the premise of this is to group hybrid classes together with a remote teacher. Again, as I told you, that common planning time with teachers is key to this, so that the teachers are delivering similar lessons at the same time. Um, and the elementary hybrid and remote, this is a little picture of what um, is gonna be happening. Now, this is not the exact schedule, but I just, we just wanted, we did this out conceptually to see how this schedule might work. So for example, this is a fully remote class here on the left. The light green is the synchronous time with the teacher. So um, the light green is the full remote kids are getting syn synchronous time. And while they're doing that, the students in the hybrid class are in white and they're working asynchronously. So the, once the teacher is done with those kids during the synchronous time and set them off to do some asynchronous work, it turns to dark green. That's where the hybrid kids are coming in and the teacher will be working remotely with the, the hybrid, a hybrid class of students. And they're doing the exact same lesson. So again, this is reading, workshop, phonics, and math. We feel like those are our core curriculum and the really important subject to be taught live by a teacher. So, and we, we really felt like even in the hybrid model that we couldn't let the reading instruction go for only two days live with the teacher. That it needs a minimum of four days a week of live uh, reading instruction. So um, you can see here, this is the teacher schedule for the full remote. She's light green is her time with the full remote students and the dark green, she is with hybrid remote students. So when the kids are at home working, they will have time with the damaged teacher um, working, helping them with their lessons. There is time after school if uh, a person in the full remote uh, needed more help, that then they could contact the teacher in the after school time. So that's just a little quick picture of what that might look like. Now at the secondary level, it looks very similar at the middle school and high school. They decided to go with a block scheduling um, format for both their hybrid and their remote schedule. The blocks are gonna be 90 minutes long, and because they are 90 minutes long, uh, the seven period schedule is spread out over the two days. So you'll see here on the Holton Richmond one, they are running uh, blocks A, C, F, and E. And the reason why they are alternating <laughs> is because um, the uh, exploratory model works the two periods together. So for example, eighth grade has exploratory A block and B block. And so if you put them both together on one day, they're gonna get like 180 minutes of exploratory and not core content. So we, they split those across two days so that the two exploratory classes exist on both days. Um, so, and as you know, we have seven classes at the secondary level and um, that we needed to split that across uh, two days. So it's an odd number. So one course is gonna be meet every day, but for 45 minutes. So at the end of the day, that block happens. And for example, here at Holton Richmond, it's E block that will happen 45 minutes on the, either the Monday or Thursday, and then 45 minutes on the Tuesday or Friday for day one and day two. Um, so when, uh, on the side here on the right is the full remote learning schedule for the Wednesday. And again, the Wednesday is when everyone's um, not in school. So there, what we did was we shortened the periods of instruction to be 30 minutes long so the kids get uh, live instruction during each one of those uh, block periods. At the Holton Richmond Middle School, um, the exploratory teachers won't be teaching during that day, but they will be available for support for like executive functioning, helping to organize kids and any kind of support that they need that kids can jump in on that block and have them help them with, um, with, their, with their work. Okay, and you can see um, in, the, um, in the afternoon, uh, there's team meetings for teachers to do, be doing their work. And again, just as I keep going through all these uh, schedules, I'm sure in your head you're like, how are we keeping this all straight? And remember, Google Classroom is our organizer. It's our learning management system. All communication is gonna be happening that, okay? The Holton Richmond full remote schedule that runs simultaneous with the hybrid, they have the same 90 minute block, but they get for 45 minutes of the 90 minute block, they get uh, direct instruction with the teacher. And um, for the other 45 minutes, they get independent work to be doing uh, while they're doing that work. While the kids are doing their independent work, the teacher is available to work with the hybrid students that are on the remote learning cycle. So again, if you look back to the elementary and understand that 
you know, some of their time is with the full remote kids, but they, some of their time needs to be devoted to the kids that are in the hybrid model working remotely. So they, that's, that's how this model plays out as well. So they split the long block in half. The direct instruction happens with the remote students, but the other half of that long block is for the hybrid remote kids to get support as well. So it's the same schedule that you saw in the hybrid. It's the same, the, the students will be following the exact same schedule in the full remote, but they, um, they don't have a 90 minute long period of instruction with the teacher. The teacher is available um, at the school too for, uh, for support if they, in that independent time if they need it. Dermatai, uh, we just put it all together here in a Dermatai slide. There, there you have a very similar model as uh, the Holton Richmond uh, middle school. They're a little bit different though. The middle school runs on a team model. So uh, for example, at the Holton Richmond middle school, they're able to run two teams in person in the hybrid schedule and they're running one team as a remote team. So uh, that's a, a little different. They have a structure in place. Now at Danvers High, they have more um, elective courses that are offered than maybe at Holton Richmond. So they are working on scheduling that, but they have the exact same schedule, their block just happen to fall right in order, A, B, C, and D on, um, on the first day and on the second day picks up E, F, G, and then the other half of D at the end of the day. And again, they have the same uh, model uh, as the middle school on Wednesday with uh, about a half an hour of instruction in each course or in each class. Um, so actually before I go to that, I do, I should have started from the beginning thanking all the administrators on our team, because I have to say, we have been up to our elbows in scheduling <laughs> over the last two months. And so this was like, <laughs> just when we thought this, the planning was done on August 6th, and then we realized that we needed to run a remote learning alternative along with our hybrid model, we all had to kick into high gear again and develop yet another plan. And this one was much more complex, because to get these two to work simultaneously together, there's a lot of logistics that we had to really think of. So I really thank everybody that's worked so hard over the last two weeks to really come up with these plans. So the next question is, what happens if we need to transition to a full remote learning schedule? Uh, all of us. So the hybrid kids need to now move to a full remote learning plan and join the remote learning students. So it looks a little different at both levels. So at the elementary level, the uh, schedule needs to change because to have students in a class of like 20 to 22 receiving reading and effective reading instruction, it's very difficult for that to be happening um, online for those kids. So what we learned from our um, spring remote learning was that was a difficult thing and to sustain engagement of students. So what we decided that we need to do is take every classroom and split it in half and have Half the kids get their reading instruction and, and math instruction in the morning, and the other half get it in the afternoon. You can see on here there's green. Um, oh, you can't see it very well, <laughs> sorry. We picked two colors too close together. Well, up here is uh, synchronous instruction from, this is grade two right across here, across this row here. On the left-hand side, the green instruction is um, in, the, in the morning where they get reading and math um, instruction. Then they would head into their specials. Well, the other half of the class got their specials in the morning, did some asynchronous work, and then in the afternoon are meeting up with their teachers for their reading and math instruction. So that cuts the, the class in half and kind of keeps that hybrid kind of model going um, so that we have smaller number of students and able to give more effective instruction. So this is at the top row here is an example of great kids in K to two, and then this one is an example of uh, three to five. Some of their courses vary. Uh, slightly uh, like their word study so but the schedules are identical and the same idea though that some one a half of the class is getting instruction in the morning and then the other half of the class is getting it in the afternoon so at the secondary level the schedules will stay the same as you saw the hybrid and the remote will stay the same in that block schedule mo model there may need to be some uh, of the remote teacher will have to continue to support the classes that have been in the hybrid model as they were doing in, um, in the, when they were in hybrid, but the kids were in the hybrid remote. So there will be some support that those teachers will be giving. And again, we're working on 
the details of that as we uh, uh, we're still planning out those details so the next step is to start scheduling students with in both models but right now getting the hybrid model going and then the fully remote alternative going and being ready for that on September 16th and actually ready for it when the teachers come back to school on September 2nd the last group that we need to talk about are the special population students we've worked on determining who um, those students are in the special populations and our initial cohort of students right now are IEP students with uh, significant and complex needs English language learners and uh, transitional and economically disadvantaged students that have been identified from our spring remote learning that really need support so we have students in that cohort we are beginning this week to get as I said schedule students and that they will be um, scheduled for four days of uh, in-person learning um, each these students will have weekly schedules developed uh, for them and shared uh, on Google Classroom and then also with um, families uh, so that they um, understand the prior prioritized skills and learning um, that has been identified for those students one other special population that we need to talk about is uh, preschool but for that we are going to bring up uh, Violetta Powers to do um, give you some more details on that good evening everyone wonderful to be here tonight and see all of you I want to talk a little bit about preschool and what we have been working on as a team um, the preschool team and administration we have been meeting throughout the summer to plan for the school year and discuss various questions concerns schedules and so forth I have to say DPW has done an amazing job getting our um, classrooms ready especially in our um, our preschool classrooms at Thorpe School as they're installing bathrooms into the classrooms and we just want to thank them so much for all their hard work and effort so as we are looking for the to, towards the hybrid model we're also making that consideration for our preschoolers our time's going to look a little bit different going into this year for preschool we are going to do our our traditionally we have the a.m. and p.m. sessions however going into this year for a hybrid model we are going to do an 8.30 to 1 o'clock session. We'll have also cohort A and cohort B. On cohort A, we'll have, it will be a Monday, Tuesday cohort, which also includes our intensive preschool students. Wednesdays, just along with the rest of the district, it will be a remote day for all of our preschoolers. And on Thursdays and Fridays, it will be cohort B which also includes the intensive learning preschool. So our intensive learning students are um, going to be coming to preschool the four days, Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday, with Wednesday being a remote day. Right now, tentatively, we are looking at Wednesdays as being our evaluation day, which in the past, historically, it has been a Monday morning. Some considerations that we are looking into and still is a work in progress that we are um, finalizing we um, need to continue to finalize our locations for various therapies, which whether it's speech and language, physical therapy, occupational therapy, the actual physical classroom setup, which our um, teachers have been uh, wonderful about coming in and starting to do the setup. Um, DPW and I have been working really hard and making sure we are doing um, social distancing, six feet apart, um, and really thinking about the materials that will be in the classrooms. We're making considerations as class sizes. Something different that will be for this coming year because we have the 8.30 to 1 time is uh, having lunch for our preschoolers. Um, we are going to be encouraging our families to send in lunch, but it is also an option um, for lunch in the building as well. Uh, we Violetta, wanna, yes. can I just interrupt you for one second? Sure. I'm sorry. Only because I'm getting text uh, for our friends at DCAT saying that um, the audio uh, on YouTube and on Comcast is incredibly low, so I don't know if it's someone can. Okay, great. Thank you. Imagine my voice not carrying. I am shocked. <laughs> it's amazing. That's crazy. <laughs> well, just open the window. We'll be fine. Um, we're also we love using our courtyard for our students uh, in preschool. We want to think about um, scheduling classrooms to be able to go outside. Obviously. Um, whether it is the, the courtyard, but also perhaps a consideration to use our larger playground in the back of uh, Riverside School and for Thorpe as well. 
Um, there are, have been some questions in regards to the expectation for aids, and um, we want to be able to really finalize those details to be able to give them our expectations and clarify some questions that they may have. Um, at Riverside um, and at Thorpe, just finalizing our arrival and dismissal procedures to make sure our students are arriving to school and dismissing safely, and also the adults that are working with um, the staff that is working um, in, in the arrival time and dismissal for everyone to feel safe um, and um, ready to come to school and leave safely. And finally, looking into transportation, working closely with our uh, student services, uh, where we are hoping and encouraging our families to be able to transport their children to and from school each day, but it is certainly right now a work in progress. Um, that is where we are with preschool at this time. Thank Any you. And Violet, one other piece sure. that we received the question on about the start date for preschool. Yes. So our start date for preschool will be September 21st. And that's typical. Preschool usually starts a few days after the correct. other grades, so, right? Correct. Uh, K to 12 usually starts the Wednesday before, and preschool starts the following Monday. Okay. Great. So thank you very much, Violetta. Thank and you. Again, I think we'll go through the entire presentation. I know there's a lot of that has happened over the last two weeks. The next part is working with our um, out of school time um, partners, and we have our Damas Recreation, so addressing child care, working with um, the Damas Rec and the YMCA. So I'll highlight a couple pieces. We have been meeting with the Damas Rec um, as another town department working together. Um, so they are looking at the Damas Rec Fun Club after school for the five elementary schools once school is back in session. Um, and they are happy to announce that they'll be in opening a new site at Thorpe School for this year. They are also looking at running a new remote learning school day, a child care program to support um, the hybrid 212 pro school program. And they have more de details to come about that. Um, one second. Okay. Um, they are also exploring other remote learning, um, child care opportunities for the community for the full day programming, and also looking at socially distancing friendly activities and programming for this fall. Then we go to the DMS Y, and um, Keith has been working with the DMS YMCA to um, answer some of their questions and be to share, have them share their program with us. So they're looking at a K-8 virtual school program um, running 8.30 to 5.30 mornings in remote learning and schoolwork, afternoons, creative enrichment and physical activities, and strengthening study habits, um, our SEL skills for our students, and navigating the virtual classrooms. They'll be following the state and local guidelines and looking at cohorts of less than um, 10 students in afternoon and morning snacks would be provided. Um, so again, information for each of those programs would come directly from both of those programs we will continue to share that. At this time, I want to take a moment to, again, look at the number of things that have happened um, since our last meeting on August 6th. The Department of Education gave feedback on the initial plans. It was overall feedback for um, all schools versus specific feedback by district. On August 11th, metrics from the governor um, in follow-up with DESE came out. I'll be sharing that in just one moment. On August 8, sorry, August 19th, information from DESE and MIAA about athletics, and we have Andy St. Pierre here tonight will give us the most up-to-date information from a meeting um, at our NEC level. Um, he'll share that with us tonight. On August 20th, um, the governor announced mobile testing um, for um, school districts, and then on August 21st, um, that was Friday, DESE put out recommendations that would um, talked about teachers in classrooms if we were all remote um, and then also um, asking districts making a recommendation that children of teachers would be included in the four day of school learning so we will continue to work on that and then the governor also has um, a new requirement for flu vaccinations um, required by December 31st for students okay so with that the information that came out and this um, refers to the health and safety that we continue to work with our unions in taking a look at metrics and um, the health and safety of our buildings. So here the governor has put out that um, a three different levels here and based on the rate of transmission and other data at the state level. Um, 
So with this Danvis for the, and let me go to that next slide, Mary. That's okay? That's okay. Um, I want to thank Whitney in our office. She will be um, continuing to keep this updated for us. This information comes out every Wednesday afternoon, and we will be updating it. Um, so Danvis has been in the green for the last um, two weeks. The information is there. What we are also doing is um, looking at all of our employees from where they live. They live in a number of communities, and we were able to look at and say 75% of the Danvis employees for our school system live in these 15 towns. Um, so we are, will be monitoring that information too. So looking at this also regionally as we continue to look at data about um, the transmission of the COVID-19. Okay, next it is time for Andy St. Pierre to give us an update on the fall athletics. Thank you, Andy. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me in quickly. I'll give you a, a quick update. A lot has happened in the last seven to 10 days um, for athletics specifically, we waited a long time to get some guidance and we did get it. Um, the EEA was the first to provide a framework for how sports could happen in the fall. And then DESE shortly thereafter came up with some guidance. And then the MIAA um, sort of outlined their, their plan in the seasons, how they all worked together, these three groups to come up with a plan that they felt was safe and would work. Um, with all that information of this past Friday, the NEC eight athletic directors got together and met virtually just to discuss the good, bad, um, and kind of where we stood as a league and what it was gonna look like if we could play, if we couldn't play. Um, and we followed that up today with a, a meeting with principals of the league and athletic directors to discuss. And at this time, I think there's four schools who are in the red zone as previously discussed on the, the last slide. So they're unable to play right now in sports. And there's a couple other communities that are in the remote mode who are opting to pass on fall sports right now as well. Um, so with that being said, the option for them is to push their season, the fall season, to what they call a floating season from the end of March through the end of April. And so the league uh, principals and athletic directors today got together and voted to adopt that as a league-wide policy. So we're all doing the same thing uh, at, across the NEC. Um, so that's, that's where we stand right now. This is all very fresh and very new. Um, so we're gonna take this information, digest it, and, and sort of come up with the plan of what athletics, extracurricular, co-curriculars will look like for the fall moving forward. Okay, thank you, Andy. And again, all of our administrators will be here for questions. Um, we are almost finished with this presentation. So this leads us to Next steps, there are a number of next steps. We will continue um, with our impact bargaining with our unions. We continue to create student and teacher schedules as Mary um, presented. Our website will continue to be updated with this presentation. Minutes from the last two meetings and the way that works is once the school committee approves minutes um, at their meeting, um, then they are posted the next day on our website. We will also update our FAQ um, on a continual basis. We are working on for um, September, the school-based family forums. We do realize again that a lot of the questions that we will get in the time frame, um, we are taking all of this in and putting it in at different places. So the family forums, um, principals are working on setting them up now so that way they'll be by school. And um, also looking at that we want to encourage parents if you continue to have um, specific questions to reach out to an administrator, to our office, to the information at damas.org. We have been keeping a spreadsheet that has all of the questions and who gets assigned, which one to answer so that we can continue to relook at them and answer them. And if we do miss something, please reach out to us again and we will reach back out to you to help you with your individual questions. We are looking at a plan for the children of teachers to be the four days, setting up transportation routes. Um, that email went out asking parents to sign up for transportation. We will release cohort assignments um, the week of um, August 31st. We are working on conducting our professional development trainings from September 2nd through September 15th. We are planning for our kindergarten grade six and grade nine orientations and then finalizing the plans for our September 16th opening. So with that, um, as Mr. Um, Thompson said, that the frequently asked questions from the public comment, so um, tonight looks a little bit different than in past um, the past couple of meetings. For the July 30th and the August 6th meeting, we had about 100 um, 
plus or minus for each of those meetings, and um, we were able to organize them and again put them into the FAQ and then also get back to individual um, parents. For tonight's meeting, there are about 20 um, emails at the moment. Um, so we are able to here put them in a list as to what they are. There's not as much of a trend, um, but looking at them um, here. Also want to point out that from the time that we asked for hybrid versus the fully remote decisions from August 14th through August 20th, we had about 120 um, families reach out for the most part because about making their decision and we were able to support them, answer questions for them before they needed to make their decision. Um, so tonight's public comments, and again, they will be part of the minutes. They um, revolve around the public comments um, and having them live or the information at DMS.org, wanting more opportunities for the live comments, and Mr. Thompson addressed that at the beginning of the meeting. Why remote access for the meeting? Again, that was addressed at the beginning of the meeting. An explanation of hybrid versus remote, that was part of the presentation this evening. The HVA system, and looking at that, that we did not put into this presentation, that is ongoing, that was part of our last presentation by having DPW and having um, the Board of Health here, our uh, um, Public Health Director with us, so looking at that, those are pieces that continue to be in progress, but we do have a solid HVA system here. We have an outside consultant that works um, with the town to maintain the system, and we're working with our unions for the questions that they do have about the HVAC system. Um, sometimes the questions about the IEP process, so those are being referred to Dr. Tatum and Student Services Office preschool um, schedules, and we were able to address that in the presentation this evening. Teacher schedules, um, Mary was able to talk about that, give examples up there, and again, we have had faculty meetings, optional faculty meetings that have been recorded, so that way those teachers that were not able to attend it can then open up their email and see the recording of an optional faculty meeting to share more of the schedules. We uh, agree this is the year that we continue to work with our core values of the collaboration um, and then adding the flexibility in patience that things that we would have normally have done months ago to be prepared for September opening we are doing day by day to be ready for a September opening and then communication so for family forums and the orientations um, address the family forums that that will be happening we wanted to have as much information as possible about the schedules to be able to share that school by school and then also um, being able to continue to answer questions um, personally as they come in to us. And then about orientations, especially for kindergarten, sixth grade, and ninth grade. So each level has been working on that. We did take off on our calendar from, again, how early in advance school systems put things together. We already had a date for the kindergarten orientation back in January when we started the registration process that came off of the calendar and we will be rescheduling that and getting that out to parents. Um, orientation will probably look, as everything else is looking different, that will look different for this year. So again, end the presentation with, we encourage our members of our um, school community and the Danvers community to send us their questions, the information at danvers.org. I am talking too quickly at the moment and we will um, continue to answer them. We have um, picked up the telephone and had phone calls with people to be able to answer them too, so please continue to reach out to us. Thank you. Sure. Um, more comments probably than questions, um, because I suspect that when it comes to the um, specifics of the scheduling, that individual teachers are probably going to have uh, more pointed and, and logical questions in terms of how the day is going to run. Um, but I do have a few. Um, in particular, how, um, well, first let me start by saying that I think that the plan that you've crafted, at least in terms of what I looked at and what I saw, is probably about as sensible a plan as you could have, given the parameters you're working within. I am very glad to see that um, that Danvers teachers will be teaching the remote students as well. Um, so I think that uh, probably gives those parents who uh, are going to uh, keep their children home a good feeling about all of this. Um, 
how, one question I had is what is the remote learning Wednesday for preschool students? What will that look like? What will that consist of? particular um, learning activities during the remote day, in addition to um, therapies and schedules that can be done remotely. For example, speech and language um, can perhaps be done in a remote way with a speech and language therapist. So that is something that is still evolving and that we are finalizing with Dr. Tatum. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, You may have addressed this, but is the town looking at uh, the uh, grade 13 filters in the, uh, for the filtration systems? Um, yes, and our next step would be to have um, a meeting with our um, teachers association and um, DPW so we can work through. Um, it really is a balancing act between the number of the filter, the type of filter, the system that we do have, um, airflow, that air exchange pieces, the CO2 levels, the humidity in the room. So it really needs to be um, that our next step is that conversation. So we've been giving reports to um, through our reopening committee and the questions that have come in um, through our DTA. We've been giving reports that uh, have been put together with our DPW and with uh, the outside consultant. And it's really time to kind of sit down and have those conversations back and forth to be able to see what are those systems or the use of, for example, the air filter, um, um, a separate air filter in a room. So all of those are in progress. There's, there's different opportunities based on what our um, HVA system is set up for. Now, it looks to me like the remote plan is, um, you've really developed that enough that if we suddenly had to go to remote, you would be able to do that pretty quickly. Yes, we did. We, it was a big part of our conversation as we were building um, those, those in. And again, there is a little difference at the elementary and secondary levels, but again, it was given the students and what's best for students at, at each of those levels. And um, so we were going to be able to make the, that switch over, if need be, to our fully remote from there. Okay. Um, so I guess I would say this. I don't have too many specific questions about the plan, um, but I want to ask, you know, raise this for folks at home, for parents, for my fellow school committee members. What we're looking at out here is essentially what, in many ways, this night is sort of a smaller version of what the classrooms are going to look like. Um, and I see Lisa nodding her head in acknowledgement. It's, it's people distanced, wearing masks. I got to say, I'm having trouble hearing what I perceive as muffled voices. Maybe you guys are having an easier time with the speaker right behind you. But with the amplification, maybe it works. But this is what it's going to look like. Our students sitting at a distance, wearing masks, unable to uh, really interact with one another. The teacher's teaching from you know, a distance at the front of the room. Maybe Lisa is just as far away from Dave as a teacher in a room would be from her students if she or he is at the front of the room. Um, we've been sitting here wearing our masks for almost an hour, and I doubt anybody in the room is enjoying the masks. Um, at least one person I noticed, mask keeps falling down below the nose. Um, there are all these things that students are going to be dealing with and teachers are gonna be dealing with uh, so that they can have two days a week with some number of hours together. And so, again, I raise the issue, and it's really particularly, I think, for Jeff and Arthur, um, because you were, the, uh, you were the two present here tonight who voted yes for the remote learning. When you see this, you know, when you hear about all this, are you still convinced that this is the right way to go, or do you want to reconsider this? That's a question for me. I'll say. Uh, it's a question for you. I don't want to okay. reconsider it. I, I'm, I'm fine with it. I'm fine. Okay. Um, I uh, 
again, I stand for the notion that we really should be uh, starting remote and seeing where the fall takes us and seeing what the experience is with other districts. We have, um, Danvers has done a, a really fine job, I think, of keeping you know, our cases down. That's why we're in the green. But Salem, I believe, is in the red. Peabody is in the yellow. Um, Hamilton's either in the yellow or red, but that's, I'm sure, based on a small population point. My point is simply that we're doing great, but communities around us are having more difficulties. And it just seems to me the more we start mixing student and teacher populations, that you know, the, uh, the likelihood of increasing cases is higher. And to me, it's a risk-benefit question. Is the benefit of having students together in a very different environment for two days a week worth the risk that come attended with that? I still think remote's better. Having said that, I know that you've done everything you can and will continue to do everything you can as an administration, as administrators in the buildings, as teachers, um, to keep things safe for the students, for the staff. I know you're going to do that. So I don't want this to reflect any doubt about that. But I still maintain that uh, we should be going remote. I respect the votes been taken. And uh, with that, uh, I'm all set, Mr. Chairman. Great. Thank you very much, Eric. Arthur. Thanks. Just a, um, just a few kind of questions jumping around a little bit. Um, so maybe, Mary, you can answer this. Um, and maybe I missed it. I don't know. But Eric talked about the kind of, um, and first of all, I'm, I'm really, really, really happy that we, we chose to do our own remote. Uh, I think that was really important. Um, I do want. Um, I really feel comfortable with our teachers teaching the remote with our curriculum. Um, so some of the teachers don't really care for me right now, but I still like them. So, um, uh, but I would, um, I think what's more likely to happen, and nobody knows, but I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about what I see right now. What I think is gonna happen is that after a few weeks, you may have a, a couple of families, a couple of kids, uh, a few maybe that want to, they see everybody else going, and now they want to go. How, how, how's that going to be done? How um, seamless can that be? Or do we still have to wait for a certain period of time? What, what, what are we looking at as far as that? I know we talked about it before, but that was before we had our own remote being taught. Yeah. Um, yes, there is going to be transition points, and they're going to be at the um, quarter level for the um, high school and at the trimester date for the middle and elementary school. So we're waiting for the natural transition in the uh, school schedule when the uh, natural time would end to bring in uh, kids that are remote back into hybrid or vice versa, hybrid kids out to remote. Again, um, there is going to be some availability. It, it depends on how the scheduling goes and the staffing of it all goes and we're still working on the kids and the scheduling. It uh, could be based on availability in our model, again, with class sizes and everything, but we really feel like that the transitions are going to be able to be happen at the quarter and the trimester, and that gives us time to really plan for, for those tri transitions. Okay, and, and uh, I'm assuming now you, you think it can be really seamless when you transition over because everybody's going to be at essentially the same point, yeah. correct? Yeah, that's right, yep. Um, okay, thanks. Um, like I said, I'm jumping around a little. So, Andy, can I ask you a couple questions? Um, so, up until uh, tonight, I, I thought that some sports were going in the fall, and and now, so we're not going to do any any sport, any games. There's not going to be any matches. Any any any. Correct. Sports okay. are happening. They're approved through the MIA to happen. Right. There's different categories and levels of the sports, and then based on that level what you can do. You can do individual skills, then the next level you can do practices, then next level is games, then next level is tournaments. So depending on which level of sport you're in, you can play in those. Um, most of them are with modification. So there's a minimum standard modification that has to be met. Right now, each individual sport committee for the MIAA is figuring out what those modifications are by sport. Each one will be different. For example, cross country would be staggered starts something to spread people out in the course mm -hmm. so they're not on yep. top of each other. Masks during play is going to be another modification for sport. Soccer, no slide tackling, no throw-ins, headers, things like that. Game sports, 
they're definitely going to be changed. They're going to be altered. It's going to be different from um, what everyone's used to. But that so sports are being played under those specifications. We so we as a league have decided not to participate based on the league status right now of the teams that could play. Right, so With that word, being said, you, we can we can offer the the MIA is allowing out of season contact for coaches, meaning that football coaches can run drills and skills and conditioning with their teams in the fall. Field hockey can do the same, so on and so forth. That's what I was going to ask. So, so they, can, they can practice, so to speak. They can, they can do things that otherwise they would not be able to do in a non-season non time. Correct. They, the MIA has allowed that for the connection piece to get the kids involved and get them back doing something they really love outside of school. You know, to help bridge that connection piece with the, the so students. so let me then just ask about one particular sport. So I, I can see um, I can see pretty much most of these transitioning to February 26th to April 15th. <laughs> what are you doing about golf? Just yeah. playing the snow. <laughs> yeah, that was a big one that came up. You know, it's it's hard. You know, the positive side of it is you're not going to play the end of February. You're probably going to wait and then cram your matches in yeah. in April. Like I said, the sports are all going to be different, whether it's rule modifications or the length of the season. So if you typically play 18, 20 matches, you're probably looking at 8 or 10 or 12, yeah. something. So you know, there's going to be adjustments. There's yeah. no doubt about it. And I don't think anyone thinks full seasons are going to happen yeah. right now. Yeah. It's, it's more logical that it'll be abbreviated season. So that's sort of what is being prepared sure. for. And like everything, we do the best we can with what you're given. So if golf has to play mainly in April, then that's how we'll schedule it. But well, yeah, course days, availability right? is going to be really tough. <laughs> You know, it's, we, we get that. Yep. All right. No, that's great. Um, uh, thanks. Um, on, the, on the question of, so sports leads me to an, the question of other, other extracurricular activities. What, what's, the, what's the thought process there? What are we doing as far as um, uh, some of those other things that kids would, would have a chance to do? I'll start and then I'll ask Mary to, um, or any of the administrators that are here too, to help us out with that. Um, it would be uh, the next steps for us, but we really need to get the, the hybrid, the full remote in place, get everyone scheduled, and then we'll be able to relook at that. Um, but I would not say that that's gonna be at the beginning sure. of um, the, the school year, but that will all be the sort of the next things like sports, any of the co-curricular pieces, that will be next step once we make our way back into school. And, and that's fair, and the only reason I asked it is because obviously if, if the sports can be set up to have practices and things like that, then obviously the kids that do other things will want to be able to do what they do too. So yes, I just yes. I just want to, that's really what I'm looking at. I mean, I, again, like everything else, it's not going to be the same as, as it always has been, but you know, if there are opportunities in athletics, then, then hopefully there'll be opportunities in other things too. Definitely. Yeah. And we've been having talks with our, um, like for example, band, instrumental music teachers, uh, Julie Pasternak and I met with the elementary uh, team and to talk to them. Um, I think Adam is, and Adam and Jason have both have, uh, had times where they've talked with their you know, band and chorus teachers and t to talk about what that might look like. So some of that work is gonna be done uh, remotely where they can play their instruments for their, for their teacher, um, but we, we are again working on phasing that in. Thank you. Um, can I ask a preschool question? <laughs> Sorry, I, I said I was jumping around. <laughs> um, hey. So the only thing I thought of, it, it sounds great, except for the fact is, except for the fact of that's a long day for, for preschool kids. So is that a concern at all? Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe I don't know. I don't, it's been a long time since my kids were that age. So. You know, it's really interesting. I always find that our families want or looking or thinking about a longer day. Um, and I think this would be a great opportunity for us to see what 830 to 1 might look like, might feel like for our students, an opportunity for them to um, even have lunch in the building, which is something that's different for them. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to see what, it, what, what that could bring. Um, and maybe something that we could even consider for the future. Yeah, no, maybe, maybe it works great. I mean, there are things that we've definitely learned through all this that are going to stay with us for, for a long time to come. So, um, and maybe my kids would have done, I just don't remember. <laughs> it was a long time ago, but thanks. You're welcome. Um, and I think you might have mentioned this, but we don't know how many, we don't know who, how many we have for the bus yet, correct? For transportation? Yeah. Not exactly. No. Okay. It is a much lower number that has come in, so we'll start to. Does um, it does it look like we are going to be able to handle it? Um, I know I know when we talked before, Keith, Keith thought Diane. it was. Yes. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, that's all I think. I mean, I, I would just say, um, um, you know, Eric and I have talked about this um, uh, this whole issue, and, and uh, we, we, have, we disagree a little bit about it. Um, but um, I, I understand where he's coming from. I understand where the teachers are coming from. Um, I've looked at everything, um, and I just think that, um, you know, on balance, really, with the, with the, the metrics as they are in Massachusetts right now, um, really, really good. And uh, with 84.3% of our parents wanting their kids to go to school, um, I just think that uh, it's, it's, it's what we need to do. As I think the governor said last week the same thing, uh, that you know, the state guidance is based upon um, medical advice, uh, immunologists, uh, or pediatrics, um, everybody, they've gotten all their advice in there, and they say this can be done the way we're doing it. I think that, that they're right. I think that we're looking good. If, if things were changed, we can switch back. But um, I think I, I trust the parents to know to be to know what's best for their kids, and if they're comfortable with with them coming. And again, it's it's almost 85 percent. I think that's where we have to be here. Um, and so that's it. Thank you for everything you've done and all the planning. It looks great. Again, I'm really happy with the with the with the Danvers remote. I think that makes a big difference, and it helps us. Sym 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 with symmetry going forward with this. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Um, so 84%. Um, that's that's a high number. I think that's about what we had predicted before too in the preliminary survey. Um, how does that break down by school um, or by other um, grades? Even is are there higher or lower numbers? Any outliers from that? No. They're around the same. It's around that, that same one with a little bit of different, you know, some per, slow, lower percentages at some of the levels. But again, that's, I, we looked at that to see if we could staff each of the models and we were able to staff the fully remote as well as the hybrid. Okay, so there's no second grade class in one of the schools, for example, that only there, had 40 or there, 50, right? There, it, there actually are a few like little blips at some grade levels, but um, we were able to, again, with our staffing and, and we were able to, make that work okay great um the scheduling uh looks great there is a lot of work that has been done uh, definitely appreciate that um there's going to be more that has to be done i'm sure too <laughs> right i'm sure there's a lot more one question i had on on the middle school it looked like there was two minutes between classes is that enough of a transition um to get through those yeah so um when we went to the block scheduling, um, what that did was it, it lowered the number of transitions significantly. So from a seven period day to a four period day. Um, and for the most part, those transitions are walking across the hallway. So we, we feel like it is enough. We'll, we'll have to play with it a little bit if you're going from, let's say, the third floor to the gym. Right. But I think that's something that internally will, and we've always been that way. We've always had to you know, have some agreements amongst the staff when they know certain transitions are happening that are further in the building that they're aware that it's going to take a little longer. But okay. for the most part, we think it's 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 there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, uh, on the the high school in particular, possibly for the middle school as well. Um, the issue is some classes, I believe, require special equipment. For example, computer science. I think you you need Macs, right? I mean, you wouldn't use a Chromebook for computer science, maybe some labs as well. Um, are those classes going to have to be restructured or have the curriculum uh, adjusted because three of the five days are gonna be remote? So I can do, I'll do middle school and then, so for our technology classes, we've worked with our teachers that they are gonna do everything via a Chromebook. So we're actually not gonna use our desktop computers in the, any of our four technology labs. They feel they can do um, the meaningful work that they need to using anything based on Chrome. It's not perfect, um, but in terms of, for us, in terms of sanitizing 25 desktops, um, dealing with that, just dealing with all the, the logistics that we felt like if we could work on Chrome and keep kids on their own device, that that was a health and safety measure that made sense. So the curriculum will adjust. Um, there, I think with anything in this plan, there are gonna be Things that are different and maybe not exactly what we want, but you're gain, you know, you're gaining something by being in the building, and that's where you maybe have to give a little bit. So for us, we're using all, um, everything will be through a Chromebook and through Google Chrome. Great. Okay. I didn't touch it. 
Hello. Uh, very similar to the middle school, so we've been actively in conversations with teachers for those classes. Luckily, uh, technology moves quickly, um, so there are a number of, like for engineering, there is software that is compatible with the Chromebook and web-based, so we're looking at as much software as possible that's web-based to be able to, like we've all said, be able to seamlessly go back and forth no matter what our setting is, uh, particularly for this year for students to have access, um, and also even band with specialized equipment on how to kind of flip the classroom so students are practicing more at home. And then when they're in person, it's more around music theory. How do you read music? How do you interpret it so they can apply it at home? Okay, anything else with science in terms of labs or um, you know, biology and dissection and things like that? Yeah, so we're still working out you know, a mix between demos that teachers can still do a lot of the demonstrations in front of the class and then again using technology where we can. And there are a lot of great simulations that we are using. Um, and we're really lucky as a district to be a one-on-one -on -one, um, for Chromebook so that every student does have access to those, um, to those demos and labs. And because that hands-on piece is so important, so we want to replicate that, just like so many things that might look a little different this year. Are there classes this year that we are going to have to drop from high school just because the majority has to be live? No, not at this point. That's all questions I have. Thanks. Thanks. Great. All right. I just have a few questions myself. Um, I mean, first of all, thank you to everyone, all the teachers, the administrators who participated in the school reopening committees. I know it's not how you want to spend your summer, so thank you so much for doing that. Um, my main question is, um, have we determined the metrics um, as to when we would switch from a hybrid model to a remote model. Do we know that once cases in Danvers get to a certain percent, then we go all remote, which hopefully won't happen? Um, or have we looked at situations like there's a hot spot in one of the elementary schools, let's say, where we could potentially have that elementary school all go remote, but keep everyone else in hybrid? Thank you. So both of those um, are the different opportunities um, that we could see during um, the, the school year. So using the metrics, the state has put this together. So again, we're in the green um, and looking at in-person or the hybrid. We have chosen to start with the hybrid. Um, if we were moved to yellow, still the opportunity to be hybrid, hybrid an opportunity or to go into remote as needed. And then only if we were to go into the red, would we be looking at the remote? We continue to look at some other pieces too, and we're working with our DTA as to um, concerns um, of looking at different numbers. So we are putting together, the, again, the spreadsheet and we'll be tracking that. But this would be our major way. And then Desi has also put together information in that. I didn't include that um, on the, the list of Desi. Um, guidances, recommend, recommendations that came out over the last two, two weeks, but there was another joint memo that came from DESE and DPH at the state level that talked about the close contact um, information and then that will help us to identify the close contact and then that working with our local DPH to be able to make a determination if a classroom, if a school needed to shut down for a certain amount of time. So that number up here is greater than eight, to go to red, greater than eight um, of 100,000 people or more, right? Obviously there's not 100,000 people in Danvers, we're what, like 27,000, something like that. Right. So our number is gonna be pretty small to actually hit that red zone, I would say. So if we hit, let's say it's three, for argument's sake, um, if we hit that today, let's say, but we haven't been there, you know, leading up to that, and then tomorrow it drops, does it have to be there for a certain length of time before we say, okay, we need to make a change? We are looking at it on the weekly basis, and then there's another opportunity to look at some of the data over a 14-day period, okay. so yes. Okay. So and we not... would consult with our local DPH and with the state as needed. So it's not a one day number not, that we automatically go to red. It's a week long or a trend that we're seeing yes. that would make the decision. Yes. Okay, great. Um, Arthur asked my sports question. Um, one of the things I think parents are really anxious about 
um, are the school specific forums. Um, and I know originally the thought was to try and do those in August, but you know, things are changing so much. So I know they're on the schedule for September. Can we provide an indication of, you know, is it gonna be the week of Labor Day that we are planning to do those? Or is I think the early in September, the better because people are just anxious. So do we have a feeling yet for when those will happen? It, it is gonna be the seven schools and we're trying to have an administrator um, from central office be with them. So we are trying, it's almost like doing the open houses that we try to spread them out. Right. We wouldn't want, right, middle school, high school, and one elementary school on the same evening. So right. um, beginning, Violetta, do you have, you have a date for yours? September 8th. September 8th. So okay. it really so is probably the, looking at that week before the week of Labor Day is where we're gonna see most of them. Okay, great. Yeah, and I agree, we need to be careful for people that have multiple yeah. children in multiple grade levels we've run into accidental scheduling issues in the past where someone has a high school student and has an elementary school student and the things on the same night so if we can if it's possible to do it on seven different nights maybe starting that tuesday and running through those weekdays that would be great thank you yes um and what else um do the teachers know yet uh if they're teaching the fully remote program or not um, no, there have been some conversations as we needed to ask questions and what um, they've given for information to human resources in our office, but that is the next step. So when we did the next steps um, on that slide for student and teacher schedules, that will be coming very shortly. Okay, I missed that date. Do we know how many remote teachers we're going to need versus the hybrid teachers? Yes, we do. Uh, we do. We uh, worked on that uh, Friday and then today at the elementary level, and um, I don't know the exact number right now off the top of my head, but I do know that you know some grade levels it's one, some grade levels it's two, and then I think there might be one that is three, and then at the middle school they have a team at each grade level that's remote. Okay. And then the high school it's uh, variable because of the different courses that they run at that right now. So. Right. They're working on that this week. Again, we're working on number of students and looking at schedules, and, and we'll know better by the end of the week. Um, which that brings me actually to a high school question. Um, Jason, I know that at least in the past, we have had, I guess you'd call them independent classes, where students can take like an online class on their own, mm -hmm. um, which are not taught by Danvers faculty. They're taught by other you know, educators someplace else. Are we still offering those, and are those numbers either increasing or decreasing based on the situation? That's a great question. So we have a couple of different programs. So we have Apex more for credit recovery for students that need to retake or earn credit. Right. Um, and then we have virtual high school that's still on a case-by-case -case basis. So where there's a scheduling conflict, if a student needs um, a particular course and based on other courses they just can't take it, they could take that. That's still an option um, this year on a limited basis. Um, and the number of requests are really gonna be around um, when we finish the student schedules, now that we know which students are opting for remote, finalizing that and making sure that we um, maximize students getting the courses that they asked for. Um, and we will be prioritizing student requests. Some of the electives might look a little different just so that we can cohort students, but we are prioritizing um, AP courses like usual um, and making sure that all students get services that they need. And will that, affects scheduling you know and again it's not going to be working the same way and the reason i'm thinking about this i remember my oldest daughter several years ago took a screenwriting course mm -hmm. um you know at the high school you know during a set block taught by you know a non Danvers high school faculty yeah so classes like that still be running and if so will they work with the scheduling being different yeah, so the schedule still is the same basic schedule. The times when the particular classes meet are a little different, yeah. but we still have that typical seven period class. Students will all have seven classes for the year. Um, and yeah, so like the VHS, the um, virtual high school classes would be, students would be designated and have a block where they can work on those classes. Okay. And my guess that was probably not synchronous learning at the time. Anyways, Correct. it was probably kind of asynchronous learning I would yes assume. mostly mostly asynchronous with some some check-ins with um, teachers on the other side yep okay so I guess the scheduling you know having to be in B block for that class isn't as big of a deal right and that um, it helps benefit students because it gives them some structure right so that every day they have a dedicated time to work on a class right absolutely okay thank you very much Thanks.
Mr. Thompson, I did get a text in from Julie Posternak that said that uh, every grade level at elementary has two remote teachers, except for grade four, which has three. Okay, great. Thank and, you very much. And, and then last, just a little, little PSA announcement. Um, yeah is uh, just to remind parents that haven't finished the completed the survey to please do so we do have a few families that have not finished that survey so that's very important information so that we can schedule your uh, student appropriately okay great well thank you julie for the information and that is really good information if someone has not completed their survey uh, or their transportation information or anything else that's been asked of them please do it and please do it as soon as possible because the administration is working hard these schedules are not easy so they need all the information so they can do what's best for every student so please keep that in mind i think that was it for questions for me eric i know you had uh, an additional question i did and thank you mr chairman um this has to do with the special populations that um, you identified lisa and mary as perhaps needing more time in the school i'm i'm assuming that some of those are students who are in self-contained classrooms to begin with. Yeah, yes. Um, but are there also some of those students who um, are receiving a service that isn't necessarily in a self-contained classroom? It's uh, the criteria that we're using for the start of uh, the, the high need students is students that are service 50% outside the general education classroom. So that's where we're. That's uh, where Dr. Tatum is uh, looking at that as staffing for okay, that. Okay. So those students will hopefully be in, like English language learners, for example. Yeah. Will they be? They're not going to be in a self-contained area, or will they? No. No. So they're going to be um, in, in school with really all the students at one time or another. Yeah. Right. And do we have any plans to um, any particular? safety or distancing protocols for that particular group of students well, or no they'll, they'll start the year with the with the um with the other student like all the students so that they will be part of that cohort that that they will be but we can look into you know thinking of placement where they are in the classroom but they are going to be here and it's only a few students because there's only a handful of students the english language learners the students that are scoring in the uh, level one or level two of the access test so uh, they're the ones that really need the uh, four days of instruction in English, and they also will be getting support from their ESL teachers as well. As they okay, classroom. thank you. Great. Arthur or Jeff, anything else? Nope, I'm good, thanks. We move on? That. Thank you. All right, great. Um, thank you all very much for that presentation. A um, lot of information. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Uh, as I said, it hasn't been easy and certainly not the way anyone had uh, hoped to spend their summer. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank so you. our next uh, item, uh, before we get to that, I just wanted to add a little context to that. Uh, the next item on our agenda is DSH culture and social media post. Um, so since our last meeting, there's been, some, there's been numerous social media posts claiming the culture at Danvers High School is not the inclusive environment that we believe and expect it to be. Uh, there have been claims of racist, homophobia, and other unacceptable language and behavior that I and I know the other members of the committee feel need to be explored. And I believe Dr. Dana is going to present a two-pronged approach regarding the situation and how we're going to work on it. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Thompson. So we have a short presentation um, with the high school, but also looking at the entire district. Um, this is um, along with the pandemic the, during the um, spring into summer with George Floyd's um, death and with um, working with parents around equity also. So we are trying to pull all of this together as we move forward for our school district and opening up again. Um, we do acknowledge that there have been social media posts, there has been texting and actions of students um, that are contrary to our mission to provide an exclusive school environment free from discrimination. Um, as Mr. Thompson said, um, racist, homophobic, anti-Semitic, sexist, um, and then um, through some social media posts, um, concerns about our work with students um, and um, and the areas of mental health. So we will continue um, to have our words become our actions. And in looking at that, 
um, would like to um, talk just a little bit before getting into this and in, in about the strategic plan so that all students will be supported in an inclusive Lisa, emotionally. I just want to double check. Can, is, can we hear her? I heard something change on the. You're good? Okay. We can't hear her, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Technical difficulties. I just wanted to make sure uh, everyone watching at home was able to hear you because this is important. <laughs> can't hear anything now. <laughs> okay. So I think we're good. Thank you. Um, so with our strategic plan that all students will be supported in an inclusive, emotionally supportive, and culturally responsive environment, um, our vision is that um, the Damas Public Schools is an inclusive community of learners that is respectful of individual differences in which all students are valued for the unique strengths, talents, challenges in a welcome environment for students and families is evident in diversity is valued and um, celebrated. Along with that, we look at promoting a safe and healthy learning environment that is conducive to high academic achievement for all students. So with that, we've been working with um, three pillars, the safe and supportive learning environments, the cohesive instruction um, curriculum and instruction and engage students and tonight I'll explain how we are going to continue to work on the safety pieces of it we again acknowledge that there have been pieces in our community um, with students um, from the Damas public schools that has um, not followed um, our vision for our students and the expectations that we have over the course of um, the last two years, we have worked with the Essex County Learning Community Grant for a culturally proficient action plan. And um, normally Mary would be talking about this, so I'm just gonna highlight the pieces um, for us and she is here to answer any questions with the um, Essex County Learning Community Grant. But again, we have been working on implicit bias, the culturally re uh, responsive instruction. Work, we've had teachers and administrators attend Zaretta Hammond's Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain, a two-day institute. Our PD this past June um, looked at instructional equity and SEL in equity. We have worked with the ADL in the past and we'll continue that relationship and um, reignite that relationship for no place um, for hate. And with our town, we continue with our human rights and inclusion and the town manager has started a IDEA um, committee um, of working with members of our community and Mary is serving on that with our town also. So with that, Danvis um, Public Schools is an equity seeking district. We know that we have more work to do. Um, we are looking at the safe and supportive learning environment, which means that students need to be physically safe in the, our learning environment. A lot of what we just spoke about in our reopening we need to know that they are emotionally safe in their learning environment. That's the work with the SEL, doing more work with the, our um, supporting students with mental health, and then having equitable learning environment. And this is really the equity piece that all students um, are valued um, in our um, school and that our students are treating each other that way also. So since um, June, um, when um, some of this came to our attention, I um, want to talk about some of the steps we have taken in the planning that we have um, in place, and then finish up with a slide about um, next steps, as Mr. Thompson talked about, as those levers and having um, the two-prong approach here. We have been working with a Grade Oak Planning Committee, and the Planning Committee is Families of Children of Color. Um, and they came forward to um, ask to really work with us and partner with us and so we really have been working over the summer as a planning group that will then extend into our district for all of our um, school levels. Again, we've been working with the Essex County Learning Community um, grant and the Summer Institute that just happened at the beginning of August. Again, we had teachers attend that with trainings and professional development around equity also. So we have had equity embedded over our last two years. It, when we um, showed the, the graphic a, a moment ago, it is now one of our pillars. We now know we have the urgency to continue to make our words be our actions in our Damas Public Schools. So along with the professional development at the elementary level, last week Teachers College came in and reading and writing workshop um, as our curriculum and the equity that is built in, so that training for teachers, and we had a number of teachers participate that was done remotely. Um, along with this, um, so I moved from the district pieces of it to now Danvers High School. With Danvers High School, there have been investigations. Uh, we continue to work with our police department, with DCF, 
this, um, our partners and um, with the other state agencies. With working with our school attorney and looking at hiring um, an outside investigator, consultant, and the school committee will be discussing that this evening. Um, that recommendation that, again, to take a look at the baseline information, where we have been. I'm just going to go back to the notes of our work with our school attorney um, and looking at um, behaviors that may have um, violated policies um, and even if they do not rise to the legal definitions of discrimination and harassment that at this time we should be taking a thorough inventory to determine what factors if any are creating um, the perception um, or the reality for students that um, that our learning environment is not welcome and inclusive for all students so getting another um, set of um, an expertise as um, working with us in that area too and working with the school committee along with that working with the Danvis um, administration looking at culture and working with Danvis care so the resources that we do have and also looking at uh, mental health um, the NAN project is um, a local organization we have been um, having remote meetings with them for support for our district minding your mind has been a resource in the past and also safe schools through DESE so those would all be pieces again it will need to look different where we are not going to have an assembly in the auditorium but how we can continue to work um, through and have trainings have professional development have ongoing conversations and that the more challenging conversations that we have um, not been as direct with working with Damas high school student leaders um, looking at athletics and co-curricular um, our student leaders um, students have come forward and saying that that's not the Damas high school that um, they want to be part of and they want to help to make change and we have seen that in the past with our world of um, women organization and having a forum on um, sexual harassment and that was um, something we had at the high school along with um, looking at a walkout that we had at the high school so we know our students um, are the um, changes for this next generation and they need to be part of that conversation and the um, actions that we are taking as adults in um, our school community and then working with our teachers coaches advisors knowing that um, their updated trainings making sure from social media policies to the trainings um, that we have for athletics and for uh, co-curriculars and our teachers to review those policies um, and again make sure that our words are uh, what we see for our actions in our school system and then our last slide looks at pulling this together next steps um, and pulling those levers together we know that we continue with making sure that any information that comes to us we do have investigation um, and working with um, our other organizations to support us with this next steps we really want to focus in on um, moving forward the assets in our community the voice and the ownership um, that this is going to take again our saying of working together for all of our students it's going to take our entire community working together to continue moving forward it will include district professional development again we've given some examples the teachers college um, castle for social emotional learning in our Essex County learning community um, consultants with the Center for Collaborative Education working with them we have another meeting uh, a remote meeting on this Friday to continue that conversation with them um, district-wide uh, families of children of color committee that will be um, an ongoing and a very active um, group working with administrators and teachers in our community again looking at data um, it's really about changing mindsets and behaviors changing the culture um, and that mindset that all children can learn and making sure that we are looking at all of our children um, in the work that we're doing and not having the barriers and then looking at curriculum with multicultural perspectives so we need all of those pieces just as we talked about reopening it's not one strategy but it's the mitigation of these four pillars that will support us in moving forward um, as a district to really make sure that our vision is in our words are the actions that we see from adults in our community in our school community and that we are supporting students um, and as they grow um, to become the um, as we talk about in our vision and I talk about at graduation every year um, that they are contributing to our global society Thank you, Dr. Dana. Thank you. Um, just quickly before I turn things over to the committee, um, just wanted to kind of reiterate that the issue is being addressed in two different ways. 
uh, each of which are being are taking place simultaneously. The first is um, the hiring of a consultant investigator by the district's legal counsel to look into the concerns raised in social media posts. The second is a hiring of an organization that can come in and review the culture at Danvers High School and the overall Danvers public school system to provide ways in which we can improve. Uh, no matter the outcome of the investigation into the allegations from the social media post, culture can always be improved, so there's no need to wait to get assistance on this issue. We can do both simultaneously. So with that, uh, Jeff. Great, thanks Dave. Yeah, um, there's nothing that's probably been you know, more troubling um, since I've, I've seen some of the um, documentation and, and social media posts. I, I'm going to clarify though, I don't go on social media a lot. I do not consider that to be my source of truth for a lot of um, these um, issues. Um, but it is incumbent upon us to take this extremely seriously. Um, it is our responsibility to protect um, students, uh, teachers, um, staff, everyone in the community um, who does not have a voice and who is, just feels they cannot speak. So this is what this is designed to do. So I 100% support this um, outside in, uh, investigation. Um, and I, I, what's the official term we're, we're calling this? Is it a review or an investigation? What is it? I don't know if we have an official term, do we? We don't have the official term. Um, when Dave and I spoke, to, thinking about an external audit, um, audit that would include the review of policies and um, the investigation piece to review. Okay. Will we have a chance to review the statement of work before this commences? as a school committee? I would say yes with the, the meeting. Um, Mr. Thompson is really around the corner again for our next meeting um, in mid-September. So as we put this together and we'll be able to share information, yes. But okay. it will be an ongoing pro progress. And we can make adjustments along the way. Right, okay. yeah, the goal is to get moving on it as soon as possible, um, take action, but certainly to you know keep the committee in the loop, absolutely. Okay. And then, so if the, um, the, the genesis for this were social media posts and were other uh, new information that, that was brought to light, how much of that will be made public before this audit, during or after? I this is why we would work with our school attorney um, for the advice um, and um, we understand it's difficult working with giving as much information to the public um, and within the laws that we have um, for um, privacy laws um, with working um, with our students. So that was, this, that was the recommendation from the school attorney so that way she can be able to support us through that process. Um, and I, I want to make sure there were also, it's social media at the moment, it has been a, a summer where since June there has been different things that have happened, so it's not only the social media pieces. There right. were pieces with the, um, and again, all of this is out on the social media, so I feel like the things that I'm saying at the moment um, with um, hockey, so investigations there, and then moving forward to anything else that was reported to us about students, so we continue to work on those pieces and then moving into after graduation, moving into um, social media posts that then, through the social mo media, allowed for more students to share experiences um, and um, sharing things that they may have heard. So we do continue to encourage members of our community to come um, to speak with either our police chief or with the superintendent um, as we put out in the letter that we sent to the Danvers um, high school community that if they have firsthand knowledge that that is really important it's about making changes um, in going forward that will help us and that's where this external audit will also support our work good uh, the the concern or the the question the reason I'm asking this is I want to be sure even before this starts that everyone has a pretty good understanding of what it is designed to do and what it is not designed to do Right, so if it's, if it's looking particularly at policies or curriculum 
uh, or, or past events, uh, that, that's fine. It should have some sort of a scope so that we can all understand so that when the outcome is presented, that we all have reasonable expectations as to what it could or, or might not include. Um, I think that would be, in particular, um, very helpful. And Jeff, just to interject, yep. um, and Dr. Dana add more, um, I would say, in general, the scope of the first one is um, a consultant to investigate, hired by the legal uh, counsel of the school, to investigate these claims that are out there on social media. So that would be interviewing as many people that are willing to come forward to gather information to find out how much of it is accurate. Um, and but but will the topics be listed? So social media is so nebulous. You could be Twitter, you could be Facebook, you could be Snapchat. I don't know what that means. Well, I don't yeah. think the platform of the social media matters. It's just about um, the, the culture at Danvers High School, particularly the whole school system, but these are particularly Danvers High School, ranging from the list that Lisa talked about from racism to homophobia to <coughs> anti-Semitism, yep. um, all of those types of things. So it's just culture that is not consistent with our expectations and our hopes from a school committee. Um, as a result of that, um, some of the information that comes out will be subject to privacy issues. Right. Um, Lisa, you know, mentioned incidents that happen, um, and I, I have seen um, comments out there about the administration sweeping things under the rug, and that's not the case. Sometimes when discipline is well, not sometimes. I believe every time when discipline is handed out, that's a privacy concern. So just because someone wants to know what happened to so and so we don't have the legal right to tell them. So right, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't wanna go down that route right now. I'm just looking for the general framework so that when we have every step laid out, so everyone as open as possible, because that, that term is, is what I'm really focused on, to be as transparent as possible Absolutely. in all of this so everyone can understand right. what so, we're and, trying and to do. And that's phase one, is Correct. You know, trying to get those people that are, are saying things um, in public forums to come forward and provide details and information. And then part two is no matter if this was happening or not, you know, you can always improve culture. So um, Lisa's aware of an organization that can come in and do like a cultural audit and say, you know, <coughs> what we're doing well and what we need to work on. Um, so those two things happen, happening simultaneously, I think is a good thing. Okay, good. Um, what, what I will say about the policy piece of this, because it, it seems a lot of this stems from, from policy. Um, as we were talking, I was thinking through what would be sort of a good framework or thought process to understand this. And as I'm sure there's stuff that's missing, and I've got two lawyers I'm surrounded by, so they've <laughs> probably got this down to a science. But I mean, the first is the policy, right? What are the policies? Are these good policies? Are they consistent? Do we have policies to address this? Do we have realistic examples of these policies in different situations, right? There might be different instances where, where something is done which would you know, violate a policy in spirit, but maybe not in the letter of the law. Um, you know, and then how do you report violations of this policy? What are our procedures for you know, safe whistleblower, um, things like that? You know, I know some of that we have but I wanna make sure that they, these are listed as well. So that's the policy itself, if we have those. How are these policies communicated, I think is the second one. You know, I know we have a handbook. What training do we do? Do we do it for teachers? Do we do it for the community at large? If, you know, are there other ways, I hope this audit will look at ways that we are communicating with students these policies. I mean, a printed paper on a PDF on an online file is not the way students are communicating nowadays, right? So I hope that a lot of that is looked at. Um, the third is enforcement. Who does the enforcement? How is it enforced? Um, what is the appeal process, right? Because I think a lot of these sorts of questions that you mentioned, Dave, as well, right? There are some privacy laws and some things like that, particularly with enforcement of the policies. I don't know that everybody understands how that is done and how that's managed, right? And so that needs to be, I think, communicated as well. And then the final piece is the review, right? So regular, consistent reviews, not just of our policies, but also of these procedures and this communication needs to happen, just like we do with our strategic plan. 
right? So we need to review this every couple years, if not more often, not just when something happens that we think this is an issue, right? So those are the, those are the biggest issues that I had um, in this overall piece. Um, question on the curriculum, who is reviewing the curriculum um, for, for the multicultural perspective? Yes, um, we have a, uh, as we go to adopt curriculum, we do have a cu curriculum selection tool that we use and that asks the equity questions um, for that, so we do that. But um, most recently, as we've switched over to the reading and writing workshop model, we found that that has um, been something that's been um, very equitable by allowing students voice and choice, voice and choice around what they read and voice and choice around what they write. And what we've really been impressed with is that the Teachers College, the diversity of authors and books that are the children are uh, read and are, and are read aloud to kids. So it shows varying perspectives and um, authors telling their stories from their perspective. So it's been, we're finding it's been such a valuable um, transition to be teaching uh, reading units of study and writing units of study K through eight in, in our school district. And then the Danvers High School has been working, building off of our models uh, in the English department um, for those curriculums. A lot of it is around uh, voice and choice. Again, our mathematics program too is like holds high expectations for all our learners and it's really getting kids to make sense of the mathematics that they are learning. And so the investigations um, curriculum also has a very uh, equitable uh, curriculum. So we continue on anything that we're adopting to, to really give it that uh, deep dive uh, into, into making sure that that is, is uh, access by all, and I think the high, Danvers High School is recently looking at an Algebra II um, uh, adoption, and again, that, um, as we looked at uh, the different programs that we would go to is, you know, how can, you know, how is this program going to be accessed by all kids and, and work for all students, so we've been doing that kind of work. Okay. One, one suggestion I might make is, and maybe this was on here and I didn't see it, but the Danvers Human Rights and Inclusion Committee, I mean, they could... I would imagine have uh, some input or review of the curriculum, um, as well as just the general framework for how this is, is being looked at as well in some yeah. of these instances. So if, if we haven't already, I would we certainly do. recommend doing that. We do Eric meet with them, because we do, uh, you know, we work together and collaborate for the MLK uh, uh, diversity uh, event, but then we also meet on other times during the year, and we do have, at one of those meetings, we definitely t do a curriculum update for the committee and they, they help us um, think through some things. Okay, great. Those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Jeff. Uh, Arthur? Uh, I think that, um, I think one of the points that Jeff was getting at, which I think is correct, is that uh, this is, if, if there's going to be an investigation, this is our investigation. This is the school committee's investigation. So uh, I think that when the consultant is, is hired, then the consultant needs to Present, present to us a plan for what they're going to be looking at and what they're going to be investigating so that we know that they're doing what we want them to do. So I think, I think um, whatever you want to call it, you know, uh, 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 a statement of intent or, or, or an agenda or a plan or whatever it is, but we just want to know these are the things we're going to be looking at. And, um, and I think we do need to, to approve that before the investigation starts because if they go, go do an investigation and, and, and we pay money for it and it comes back without what we wanted to get done, that's not gonna, that's not gonna be good. Um, so overall though, this issue is as important and in the long term more important than the issue that we just talked about, um, which is also an important issue. Um, but that first issue is it's complicated. It has it has all kinds of, of considerations and concerns and and, and different viewpoints and, and different um, uh, evidence and, and people have a hard time you know coming to conclusions and, and despite the, the, that we all try to do the best we can you know there's no perfect answer there, but this one's easy, okay. Um, and since I started on school committee, which is 14 years ago. Uh, and Eric's been there longer, and you'll remember this, though. We, you know, we always used to say, and we, just, you know, the kids are only going to learn if they if they feel safe and comfortable in school. And if they don't, then it's not going to it's not going to work from an educational standpoint. Other and, and all the other things that come with that. Um, and when I first started on the committee, that was when we were really starting the the, the bullying program. And we used to say all the time. Um, 
again, that, that this is crucial to what we're trying to do because everybody needs to be respected, everybody needs to, to, to feel happy coming to school. I mean, you know, not, not everybody's thrilled to go to school every day, but they need to feel safe and they need to feel welcome and they need to feel like they can do what they want and be who they are. Um, and I think for the most part over the years, I, I think that, that, you know, we really worked on that and, and, and it was something that I think we did pretty well for, for a long period of time. You know, we had Danvers Cares focused on that a lot in the early, earlier years that, that we were doing this. And, um, uh, and now we're talking about social and emotional learning a lot. And that's, fine. that's important. That, that's part of this whole thing, too. Um, so the bottom line is that I don't know what's true or what's not true about certain allegations that have been made. But there are allegations that are not, to me, um, uh, not that they are, they potentially are credible. There are things that people have said that, that, that we have to be concerned about. And if anybody, if anybody, if there's one person is, is not treated appropriately at, 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 during, in our school system, we need to deal with it. And we can't be perfect, we're not gonna get every single case, but, but we need to try to strive to do that. And so, um, I totally support this, this, this two-pronged approach that, that you, you mentioned, Dave. Um, and I want to make sure, and, and, I, and I also think it's important to get the outside investigator to come in because people feel, whether it's warranted or not, they, the, the people that have a complaint will feel limited when they're talking to the, us, the administration themselves, and, and, they, and they feel, and they're not as gonna be as open. And we need to have people feel safe and secure as far as coming and doing that. So. Um, I think this is, this is something we need to do, and I think it's good. I think it will give us, as, as I think, Lisa, you said, a, a, a baseline. Where do we need to improve? What do we need to do to make things better? What do we do to, to, to make all of our population, for whatever reason it is, feel like they, they're, they're, they belong to, to our community, they're happy to be here? Um, because we can't tolerate anything that, that does not meet that standard, and that's, that's what we talk about every week, but we have to make sure that we're really implementing it. So. Um, again, I think this is an easy issue. I think, yes, we definitely do this, and, and let's make sure that, that the kids coming to school this year and, and, and the years after um, feel wanted and, and respected and, and can do what they need to do when they get here. Anything else, Adam? No. Okay, great, thanks. Eric, as the liaison for the uh, Human Rights and Inclusion Committee, I'm anxious to hear your thoughts. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I actually spoke uh, at their meeting last Thursday. And uh, you can imagine there were a lot of questions, concerns, thoughts when I gave them the update. It was uh, an open meeting. It was on DCAT. Um, I tried to be as open about the context of all this uh, as I possibly could. And I'd like to treat this as uh, sort of my update about the committee meeting as well. Great. Um, and, and let me start by, by saying to everybody here what I told them, because I think it's incumbent on us to be as factually transparent as possible within the realm of things that, uh, the fact that we can't always say everything. But what I told them and what I say tonight is that uh, the, the event that really brought this to everyone's attention was the senior parade which took place in June. And during the course of that parade, students in a vehicle in the parade unfurled a sign, it was after the parade started, a banner that was in favor of a particular political candidate. It doesn't matter which one. But the fact that that happened in a parade that was really intended to be a celebration for the seniors, ended up angering parents, angering some of the students. And what it seemed to do was cause one or more students to come forward with concerns that they had had about the atmosphere at the high school and about things that had gone on that they had prior to that kind of been sitting on, maybe they were simmering, but when this happened, it was as though the bottle was unloosened a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's when uh, the administration um, was presented with some concerns about activities that 
could probably be described as questionable in terms of potential, uh, maybe a, a bullying aspect to it, certainly. Um, questions about whether conduct was appropriate in terms of uh, homophobia, in terms of ethnicity, um, that warranted a deeper investigation. And as uh, Lisa said in her letter to the community, I, the investigation was undertaken by the, uh, the police and the schools. Multiple witnesses, I think in excess of 20, were interviewed. And ultimately, um, it was decided by the, the police, they did not feel that anything that happened warranted criminal charges. Having said that, um, Rob Sullivan, who is the liaison from the police to the um, inclusion committee, did mention at the meeting that they actually did speak to the Essex County DA just to make sure they hadn't missed anything. And he concurred that there was no criminal activity. So at that point, it became an issue for the um, administration here to, to deal with from the standpoint of, okay, if we believe this conduct, even if it's not criminal, if the conduct complained of ran afoul of what we expect from our students, there should be some, I don't even want to call it discipline, but a disciplinary-like response. It's not something you just let sit, let sit there. And I think that process was undertaken by Jason, by Lisa, I, mean, I think that happened. But then, of course, the problem is you can't tell everybody, people who complain, people who raise the concerns, you can't say, here's what happened. Hands get tied. Um, but from a communication standpoint, the students, I think, who brought this information forward need to know that, yes, um, we understand the reason for the upset. We understand the reason that you brought things forward, and it was dealt with in the best way possible, and it was dealt with in detail. And uh, there were ramifications to it. Um, so, it, you know, the issue was not ignored. I think that's important that people understand. Um, possibly as a result of maybe the feeling that nothing was done and other things that were simmering, then we have after graduation, we have the uh, sort of second round, now the social media stuff begins, which raises, as Arthur and Jeff have said, some really troubling uh, questions about uh, student conduct, about the atmosphere of the high school, about students who are differently oriented, feeling truly supported, um, feeling listened to. Um, and again, we're, you know, are there responses when there's bullying activity? And I think that's where we are tonight. And I, I wholly support the idea of uh, taking a deeper dive from the standpoint of an investigation, from the standpoint of a uh, consultant in terms of finding ways that we can improve. And I firmly believe that uh, Jason and Lisa also feel that way. Um, I am convinced that, uh, that all of us here and all of us in the school system want our schools to be a place that are safe for our students, where they feel like they can be heard, where they feel like they will be supported when um, things come up, when they, when they experience difficulties. I will say, too, that, as Arthur mentioned, we don't know, you know, it's very dangerous to assume that everything that you read represents everything that happens or is, uh, exemplary of what happens. Um, I suspect that most of our students have a good experience, don't experience bullying, but the fact is, if any of them do, it's something that has to be addressed. And the other thing I would point out is the, the difficulty that I think that teachers, administrators, uh, the assistant principals, everybody face in trying to address things as they happen, trying to decide when a, what seems like a small event may warrant something larger or a, or a larger reaction or may be indicative of something larger. It is not easy dealing with the, um, the things that happen in any school, especially a high school, as kids get older. Um, so having said that, if we can learn something, if we can take what has happened as an opportunity for self-reflection, 
as an opportunity to look at what's gone on and see if there are things we can do better, then we ought to look at this as uh, be grateful that some of this information has come to light. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, it's going to make for a better school system, a better atmosphere for the students. And I think uh, as educators, you're going to be able to have more confidence that we're doing the right thing for our students. And that's what we're all here for. Um, just a moment, Mr. Chairman. Now, other than the issues that, uh, or, the, or the ideas and, and the plan that Lisa has put forward, mm -hmm. the only other thing I might suggest specifically is uh, some professional development for non-specialists around issues involving mental health, anxiety, how to help students through an anxiety attack, um, what to do, because obviously the perfect example is the student who is sort of emotionally wanting to leave the class or wanting to get out of the atmosphere. You want to try and help that student work through that and stay in the class and, and so there's this sort of push-pull of trying to do what's best for the student, and it seems to me the teachers need every tool that we can give them to make that happen. So to me, this is about finding out what's happening. It's about you know, walking the, the talk when we talk about zero tolerance for bullying, zero tolerance for uh, racism, homophobia, um, but it's also about supporting our administrators and teachers who are the ones who have to sort of execute on a daily basis while we sit here once a month and talk about it. So um, it is, I think both Jeff and Arthur pointed out, um, this is about as serious a problem as we're ever going to face on the school committee and that we ever do face. Um, and things that have been brought forward have to be looked at and it's okay if we find out Absolutely. that we can do better or that things happen that uh, in retrospect, you know, we could have taken action about who knows. Whatever we find, it's a positive because it's going to make us better. So um, I, I just want the, the teachers, the administrators to understand we look at this as an opportunity. We're going to get better and we're behind you as we all walk through this. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree completely. This is an opportunity. This is something that we must uh, take action on immediately. Uh, I don't think we mentioned enough, um, as you just did, Eric, professional development. I think that's critically important. You know, times change, professional development needs to change. Uh, I think it's critically important that all of our coaching staff and extracurricular leaders, uh, especially those that aren't teachers that might not be getting that training, um, go through, you know, this type of cultural mm -hmm. awareness training. Um, so they're prepared to deal with the students. Sure. One more point, Mr. Chair, because sure. Jeff, you mentioned the inclusion committee. They expressed to a person that they would um, do anything they could to help us through it. Uh, they they wish they'd had a, a little heads up about what was happening yep. when it was first happening. But uh, I explained, you know, with the privacy concerns, that's very difficult. But they uh, expressed a willingness to do whatever we need in terms of helping us. So that's Good. an apt point. Good. That's great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, uh, I'm going to disagree with, with Arthur saying that this is easy. Um, I think it's far from easy. I think it's um, a huge challenge for everyone involved because everyone's coming from this with their own experiences, their own implicit biases. So for you know teachers and everyone in school to be able to teach something, that might not be what they're hearing at home. So I think, you know, this is a, obviously a huge national issue. Oh. This is not anything that is specific to Danvers. You know, we were alerted to this, you know, recently, and we need to take action on it. Um, but it's going to be, you know, potentially ugly. We're going to probably hear things that we didn't want to hear about the district um, and find out things we don't want to find out. But we need to learn all that information so we can then make it better. You're not disagreeing with me. Uh, it's easy. Our vote is easy. The vote is the easy. The problem is not easy. The yeah. vote is easy. Yeah. I, well, I definitely agree with you on that. And I also um, agree with you on what a great job the district's done with the bullying uh, prevention curriculum. And I don't see why we can't implement something like that at the very early, early grades. 
and bring that all the way through high school just like we did with the Albeus bullying curriculum because this is equally as important as bullying. Yep. I think and it's, and it's, and it's my name it. is shame and it's, it's tied together. It, it is. Absolutely, yeah. yep. And uh, we shouldn't assume that bullying isn't a part of this either. They're not mutually exclusive, absolutely. Any other thoughts on that before I turn it back to Dr. Dana? Dr. Dana, any comments from you or any of the administrators? Do we need a vote to authorize this, or, or do we not need a vote? I didn't think we needed a vote, but... I, I'm fine, whichever. I'm I just want to make sure we're doing it the right way. But we will absolutely make sure that the committee is aware of what the scope is and in agreement of what the scope is before the investiga investigation or whatever we're going to call it takes place. And then also, uh, in terms of the... Um, consultant you're planning to hire for the culture. I don't know if we need to necessarily know the specifics about that, but the more you can share, the better, obviously. This will be an ongoing um, agenda item, so that way it is um, the urgency and that we are having those consistent conversations together. So we thank you for the support, and um, as you said, the two-prong approach is gonna move us in that direction to take things that have been very difficult and um, move forward um, and make positives for this community. Great. All right, so we're moving on to unfinished business. Okay, thank you. Under the unfinished business, the superintendent recommends the following policy updates for a second reading due to COVID-19. Our transportation policy, the COVID-19 student handbook addendum for masks, calendars, and our town travel policy. Uh, so moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Discussion, do you wanna talk about those policies, Dr. Dana? They're for the second reading, so we were able to at the last meeting to go over them. Um, the transportation, I was able to, we followed through with then putting out the email to ask who was um, interested in needing the transportation. I did get an update that we had about 300 um, students needing the transportation. Um, the masks continue to be, well, Again, with any new information, we would bring that on a, a monthly basis to you, but that seems to be where what we need at this moment, the school calendar. Um, again, nothing has changed in the two weeks for that. We updated preschool um, there, and then the town travel policy, which um, is a reflection of the governor's orders for um, any quarantine from certain um, areas of travel. Great. Uh, any comments, Arthur? No, well said. Jeff? No comments. Eric? All set, thank you. I am all set as well. So uh, all those in favor of these four policies for a second reading, say aye. 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 Hearing none, they all pass. Okay. Um, moving on to new business. Thank you for new business. We have two items. First, we have our homeschool proposals. The superintendent recommends the approval of the notice of intent for the home education um, families for the 2021 school year. Move the uh, homeschooling proposals as a group. Second. Okay. okay, so we do have an update for you. Um, again, with um, COVID and the health pandemic that we have at this time, this does look different than in normal years to give a comparison and we gave you um, an overview chart for you uh, for your reference. In 2019-20, we had 14 families um, for homeschooling for the 2021 school year. We're at 27 families for homeschooling. Um, so for the number of students, last year would have been 23 students. This year, we are looking at 42 students participating in homeschooling. And um, with that, um, there were three families that moved in from other, uh, other districts that were homeschooling in their prior district, um, which leaves us with 14 families that have made a decision for homeschooling for this um, year. And you can see that they are at various levels. Um, we are working with them. Um, they came in with um, very, they've done their research um, for homeschooling um, during this school year. This isn't about homeschooling, but just wanna add one other piece that we are looking at um, is the kindergarten numbers. Kindergarten is where turning five into six year olds and the, the state law is really, you have to be in school by age six. Um, so we do have families um, at the kindergarten level that are either homeschooling, um, looking at staying um, in preschool and out of um, a private preschool, 
they may be looking at a private kindergarten for a year, or they may be looking at waiting and then returning, um, coming to first grade uh, for next year. So as we look at that, there's probably about 25 students in that group also. Um, so it could be one of the pieces where 2021, that kindergarten class has a blimp with an extra teacher again in that, and that would follow through for um, kindergarten through grade 12, um, remembering the, the COVID pandemic of 2020. Questions, Eric? Uh, no, I mean, these, if the, once the superintendent approves, then, then uh, we almost by law just have to do the same, so I have no questions. Great. Jeff? No questions. Okay. All set. All right. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 And it passes. Thank you. Next, we have um, our handbooks, um, which we have put off as we were working on the reopening pieces. Those are the superintendent recommends the approval of the proposed 2021 pre-K to 12 student parent handbooks for a first reading. So moved for first second. reading. Great. We have a motion and a second. Okay, you thank you. Um, in the past, we probably would have had each school come up. I will just give a short overview of um, the handbooks where the majority of the information is very similar to um, past years and it's with the um, addendum for the COVID that we are looking at. So in your packet, you do have um, a cover sheet for each of these of looking at it. Starting um, at the high school level first, um, one second, nope, I'm actually gonna go in the opposite direction. Starting at the elementary level first, um, looking at um, The updates there, birthday celebrations, um, snacks, um, bus eligibility, and um, a lot of this was um, just updating some information and also looking at having preschool to go to the Thorpe School, the new school calendar in there um, for the elementary. For the middle school, um, revising pieces of it to um, show the focus that we have on social emotional learning, um, the structure, um, the current organizational structure and con contact information has been updated. Moving sections, again, to reflect what is happening at the middle school between discipline and expectations, um, renaming a section that used to be called security to having it around safety. Um, and those would be um, the major piece. That we you spoke about bullying prevention, updating our bullying prevention policy there, reporting versus telling. At the Danvis High School, some of the updates there um, are looking at um, electronic devices. They've added a frequently asked questions, and then they're again formatting updates that we've had. Also at Danvis High School, and they have worked with their um, school faculty to share this information, is updating um, the responsibilities of our leadership team of always looking at. Um, the strengths of our team. So we have um, a, a newer team at Danvis High School um, coming together over the last couple of years. So Amy Gerard will um, have some of the student discipline um, along with her curriculum and then Peter Demuro um, also strong in curriculum. Um, so splitting up humanities in the math science areas, they will be working together for that 9-10 um, discipline and student management and the curriculum pieces are the major pieces changes there. And then for middle school and high school, there is an addendum for the um, COVID-19, um, which reiterates some of the pieces, and we will, again, be sharing this all with parents um, as we get closer to the start of the school year. So looking at the size of cohorts, again, we're working on entrance and exit procedures that was, that was spoken about this evening, hallways, the hand washing, sanitizing, um, lockers, mass breaks, and personal belongings um, are highlighted in there, again, for parents. So, beginning to really start to share that and document um, what we have been working on during the summer. And we have principals here that um, any specific questions that you may have. All right. Jeff, any questions? Uh, no, I mean, it's, it's consistent with what I, I think we're, we're dealing with right now. So we definitely appreciate um, the, the addendums um, that address that, but no, I'm, I'm fine with them as they are. No questions. Great, Eric? No, I'm good, thank you. Great. Arthur? I'm also fine, thanks. As am I. Okay. So we are all set um, to, we need a 
uh, vote for the first reading. So all those in favor of the um, student handbooks for 2020-21 for a first reading, say aye. 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 And that passes. Okay. We'll move to order of business. Thank you. So, Mr. Thompson, this would be that opportunity that we could have our administrators transition as we finish up our school committee. Um, Great. Thank you, thank thank you, you so all much very for being much. here this evening. Thank you. Good night, all. Yeah, thank you for all your help and work. Okay, so the order of business for school committee communications. Every month we have our North Shore Education Consortium, and we've attached for you their reopening plan. Um, we have met. Um, remotely during the summer to hear updates um, through the school closure and then into summer programming and now for their reopening plan. So um, a different level of um, reopening um, and with the um, types of students and the needs that um, the students uh, that attend the consortium have, but that they are addressing that and working um, with their school community and their um, teacher association also. Legislation next? Yes. Uh, Eric. Okay. Um, I did have a chance to talk with uh, Representative Spiliotis today, and uh, he said there's not much new news in the sense that, you know, beyond what's already been out in the paper and, and what has been talked about over and over about the school opening. He said the um, one thing for us to keep in mind is that the monies that have been coming to the school to assist with. Uh, with the COVID-19 preparations and whatnot um, that has allowed the town to stay level funded and all of that um, basically are based on the federal dollars that have been received by the state. And he has some concern slash thought that once the election takes place in November, regardless of who wins, um, that the incentive to continue funneling money directly to the states will be uh, lessened in terms of the federal budget. So um, he said, you know, just kind of be aware that if there is going to be a crunch in local aid, it may happen then much as it happened late in 2008 or 2009 when we had the, uh, the Great Recession. So things are okay now, but looking forward, we have to keep our eye on the budget very carefully. Great, thank you. Um, Jeff, any update from Danvers Cares? Uh, no, the, in the process of scheduling the meetings for this year right now, and we'll have an update on the, the next meeting. Great. Lisa, anything with CPAC? CPAC has been very involved with our reopening committee, so um, we thank both of our co-chairs for um, actively participating, helping us with the um, family surveys, um, so we continue to appreciate and um, that, those opportunities to work with our CPAC. Uh, there's nothing with policy that I can remember nope, I since our last we, meeting, correct? Yep. Nope, All right. It. Just wanted to make sure I wasn't missing something. <laughs> uh, and Eric, you gave us the diversity and inclusion uh, update. Anything else for that? No. No, Mr. Okay. Chair. Great. Um, so we'll move to minutes. Um, I move, Mr. Chair, that the we approve and release the minutes from the February 24th, June 8th, July 13th, July 30th, and August 6th, regular meetings, and to release the, uh, I think it's an FY. Yeah, it looks like a typo, the executive uh, session minutes uh, of uh, school, school year. year. Oh, school year. Oh, school year. Okay. School year, I'm sorry, school year 1920 executive session minutes. Second. To release the executive session? The minutes for the executive the session, I believe. So release, we, okay. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor? <laughs> Aye. 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 Uh, the minutes pass. Donations, I know Keith is not here. Do right. we have? So we do have one update. Um, we have Staples Connect um, has been working with the, the school system in making donations. So um, they've been able to donate um, the plastic face shields and also some school supplies. So we, we thank them for um, that program, Staples Connects. Great, thank you to Staples. Uh, personnel. So in your um, packet, you do have the personnel memo from um, Keith's office um, for um, what has happened through the summer through today. Okay. Great, 
Thank you very much. Um, any comments on personnel from anyone? No. Okay, great. I believe that is it. We just need one more motion. A motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much and good night, Danvers. Thank you. Oh, I forgot to announce our next meeting. <laughs>